right, well, we're back in the shop today, and today we have my F80 seat time drift car in here. This thing needs some upgrades. There's some stuff we didn't get to during the original build, and it's some stuff that really needs to get done. So if you're unfamiliar with this car, basically we put this car together in two weeks for drift week, shipped it across the country to Arizona. We did seven track days with it, over 1,200 miles of street driving, and fortunately for us, the car held up really well. But that being said, the first time we drifted it was in Arizona. So we did have some teething issues to work through. Just some little odds and ends that you only find out about when you actually start beating on the car and drifting it and all of those things. So we worked through most of them. There's still some lingering ones. But again, there's some upgrades and stuff that we had planned to do from the beginning, but we didn't have time for. So now that we're back home for a couple of weeks, we don't have any events to go to. It's time to get this thing sorted out so we can start driving it and enjoying it again. And ideally, if we do get it all sorted out at the end of this, we'll take it and do some, uh, some throwback Mexico uh, street slides. Uh, I haven't done those in a while and it'd be, I think it'd be really fun in this car. So we'll see, hopefully we can make that happen. But that being said, we do have a lot of work to do. So we're gonna dive in. We're gonna start with the rear end. We've gotta tear most of it apart to fix a few little things. So I'm gonna quit jibber jabbering and we're gonna get to work. Right, Josue? Are we getting into it? And there. So we started tearing into this thing and we've got to take a lot of this stuff off. We've got to get the calipers off. We've got to get the rotor off. We need to get in there and get the hub off. There's a, a lot of work to be done for the little things that we need to do. Now, one of those things is replacing the axle, but that's kind of a byproduct of the other project we need to do. We have an issue with our speed sensors and it's causing all sorts of problems with the car. It's making it really obnoxious with all these error codes and all these issues. And I thought we'd have to pull the hub off to pull the dual caliber bracket off to get the ABS sensor are off but I came up with a better way it's always nice when this happens give me this thing hey. oh we don't really I don't we don't need to pull the hubs off actually I think we can just take the bolts out pull the plate back enough to get the yeah. sensor in so this might be easier than I thought so basically what we need to do is get our dual caliper bracket unbolted because it is in the way of getting to our ABS sensors. The dual caliper bracket is there to hold our secondary caliper, which is for our handbrake brake system. So while we're doing this, we needed to replace the axles anyway, and this is what I was dreading the most. We had such a fight with these axles, getting them out the first time, getting them back in. I'm not expecting this to go well at all. This thing just came loose. What's that? The axle just came out, dude. The axle came out. <laughs> what a miracle. <laughs> All right. Miracles happened. <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Let's go. I was literally like when I was loosening the nut, it started sliding back. And I was like, what? Good shot, good shot. Oh wow, what a freaking miracle, dude. I'm gonna truth, will this one? Oh no, not so lucky this time. Remember that whole fight we had with the actual Chrissy? But we're changing them. When you're doing the thing over there? Yeah. Yes. Changing them because the boots are all torn up in duct tape. And that one just came right out. Slid out like by hand. This one didn't. I didn't get that lucky. Got close. We're all separate and setting this up and we barely needed it. The only problem it bottoms out is how I messed up the last one. I ran it all the way in. Like, Kept it tightening. What a miracle. Hopefully the next set of axles does just as well. We'll have to do the same on these new ones. There we go. That's it. I didn't even feel it. This is a long sign. Remember that. Passenger long. All right, axles are out. If you followed along with the original build series of this thing, you'll know how big of a deal that was. We spent 
days trying to get those axles out originally. We had bought spare axles in case we couldn't get them apart. We tried to put them together with new hubs and wheel bearings and it didn't work. They would not go together. We were hammering them trying to get them to go together and almost pushing the wheel bearing apart. So we put our old wheel bearing setups back in, still had to kind of force them in. Uh, and I expected them to be a solid fight coming out, but uh, fortunately they both came out pretty easy, all things considered. I was prepared for a big fight. We used this PB penetrating grease on them and it definitely helped. I feel like this one has a little more Maybe that's why it came out a little more easily. But yeah, so we've got some spare axles. Some axles that don't have the torn boot. So this is what I would consider a teething issue. When we first were headed to Drift Week, where the second caliper mounts, as you can see it's right there, it would go right here. The wine and fitting were really close to the sway barring link. And I didn't want to risk them smashing into each other. I ordered fittings, but I wasn't going to have them in time. So I took the sway bar and links off, left the sway bar unhooked. But since the sway bar goes over the subframe and it's kind of firm in place, when the car was loaded down with six, 800 pounds worth of stuff in it, the axle was pushing up and rubbing on the bottom of the sway bar, which then tore the axle boots. So we ended up putting the end links on after that, changing the fitting, doing all of that stuff. But obviously the boots were already torn at that point. So these boots held up through pretty much all of Drift Week being torn in duct tape. So yeah, anyway, we got new axles. The other thing we're gonna do, and the reason this is kind of a, a twofer, is we're gonna change our wheel speed sensors. So I'll show you what the deal is with these. We had to modify these a little bit to fit in here with the bracket bolted on. So we're gonna unbolt the bracket so we can fit some fresh ones and hopefully solve our issue. Uh, so yeah, enough jibber jabber, back to work. Yeah, now it's like, nah, gotta go. Oh, yeah, like, uh, crooked as hell. All right, let me show you guys this. Basically, to fit in this slot here, we had to grind down the, the tabs that hold this speed sensor center in this hole. So we tried to eyeball center it, but as you can see, it's crooked in the hole. And what's happening is we're losing the rear speed sensors, which, lose it, which means we lose the speedometer. So the speedo will randomly work and stop working. Now, that wouldn't be that big of a deal in a normal car, but in this car, there's a lot of things that are based off the Speedo, you know, the auto door locks and little things like that. Some of the error codes come up repeatedly until you're driving. But the biggest thing is the electric steering. So this car has an electric steering rack. And the way these racks work is, you know, they give you a lot more assist when you're going slow at parking lot speeds than they do when you're going fast like highway speeds. So that way the car is not twitchy. You get really light steering when you're trying to crank the wheel and park somewhere, but heavier steering when you're at speed. Well, the problem is when the speed sensor doesn't work, it defaults to the lightest possible steering, which means it's giving us as much assist as it can possibly muster. And because of that, I think because of that, my theory is, uh, we've damaged the rack. The rack's kind of getting a little, a little clunky, making some weird noises when you try to turn to walk. And I think that's the reason. I think we just kind of overpowered it so many times because most of the time the speedo wasn't working while we were drifting and caused that issue. So we're hoping that replacing the speed sensors, putting them in with the tabs intact so they are perfectly centered and can read the ring correctly, will solve our issue. Moral of the story. <laughs> so I'm gonna pull this out. We're gonna get these swapped. You can kind of see what I mean. These are what were the tabs, which are all ground smooth. So we ordered some brand new ones from Turner Motorsports. Very convenient to have a place like that where you can get all your OEM parts. Yeah, see, that's, that's how it's supposed to go. It's in there nice and tight, nice snug fit. That's the most logical answer to our problem because we never had any speed sensor issues until we took the car apart and did all these projects and we have errors concerning our rear sensors that were totally fine prior to doing all these projects so that's my best guess at least so once we get the new sensors put in and the wiring routed for those all we've got to do is reverse process now i like to use loctite on stuff i don't like to use red loctite going into aluminum it's not ideal but i ran out of blue loctite we use that stuff a lot i used to never use loctite on anything when working on cars because i didn't want it to be difficult to get off and now i use it on everything but we got the caliper brackets bolted back up and then it was more fighting with the axles they went in fine but the the threads on the end of them we had this problem with the last set and even with these new nuts they just the threads get really marred up and you look at them we file them and they look okay 
but then the nut just does not want to go on cleanly. So we made sure to be cautious, take our time, not try to just ramrod it in there with the impact and have Josue hold the hub while I just slowly tightened it into place, backed it off every so often and checked it just to make sure that we weren't cross threading it. It's just one of those things. If you didn't know any better, you would think you were just cross threading this nut on there, but it's just kind of how it goes. Just BMW things, I guess. So with the fresh non-torn boot axles in, it's time to just put the rest of this thing back together, put the brakes and everything back on. Now, before we put the main brake system back on, we need to swap the pads. Now, this is something we needed to do before Drift Week, but one of those things that uh, fell by the wayside got kicked off the list when we were running so low on time. So I wanna get this done now. We've got some nice Hawk pads for this thing. The old ones were squeaking and grinding. They were uh, pretty worse for wear. So fortunately, this car having two piece opposing piston calipers, it's about as easy as it gets to swap pads. It's a little trickier when you have the caliper unbolted, actually, ironically. The one issue we're gonna have here is that if someone has filled the brake fluid after the pads are worn, so as they wear down, the pistons push out further and further and further, your brake fluid goes down and down and down. So now when we're pushing the pistons back in, we're pushing that fluid back up into the reservoir, which is already full. So that was a little bit of a struggle and a little bit of a fight, but we got it done. We got them swapped out. And as you can tell, not a moment too soon. Those pads were absolutely cooked, especially the fronts. All right, well, the rear suspension <laughs> repair, modify, upgrade, whatever you want to call it, uh, went pretty well. So our new used axles, but axles with non-torn boots are back in. We got all the arms hooked back up, calipers back on, new wheel speed sensor in with no tab trimming. Fronts were really, really cooked. <laughs> like These pads were toast. They were toast before the trip, but Doing, you know, nearly 1,500 miles and drifting and left foot braking really, uh, really did them in. So we got some Hawk DTC pads for the front, some HPS 5.0 pads for the rear. Really good street track combo, perfect for what we're doing with this car. So with that, we're done with the suspension stuff. We do have actually quite a bit more work to do, but I want to see if the wheel speed sensor thing fixed our issue or not. If our speedo is going to work, we should know pretty much right away. So we're going to toss the wheels back on and back it out of the shop and see if it works. Fingers crossed. Hopefully it is. All right, well, the rear did not fix it, unfortunately. What we did notice was that the front, there's a hole that the sensor goes in. And if it was in that hole, it was crooked with where it's gonna read the ring um, with the magnets. So I took it out of the hole, put it basically 180 from where it was, and then it was square with the magnets on both sides, and now it works. So hopefully it keeps working, it's not a fluke, but it, it seemed pretty consistent on that short little drive I did. So. Before we dive into the next step, which is tearing all this apart, I wanna get this thing cleaned up and drive it a little bit more. Make sure, you know, that way I can rest easy tonight knowing whether or not it's fixed. Plus this thing really needs a bath. It's bugging me looking at it so dirty and the other one needs a bath. So we're just gonna wash them both at the same time. Right, Josue? All the tag team in today. Well, I guess that was yesterday, but you look majestic, huh? Let me get a little closer so you get that depth of field. Wow, so majestic. So if you know me, you know I'm not a big wash my car, detailing it kind of guy, but with these cars, I've tried to get better about it. I've tried to keep my cars clean, and this poor car has never had a chance to be clean. It was super dirty when I bought it. I mean, filthy. We washed it as soon as I got it home, just a quick wash because we were running out of daylight, and then it got dirty again. We built it for a drift week, shipped it out without washing it, never washed it, never had time to wash it on drift week, and then shipped it back home. I washed it when it got home and immediately got rained on and then got drifted in the rain. So in the entire time I've had it, it has not been clean for more than a day or two. So I'm pretty excited to, to take our time on this 
and get it really cleaned up, do a nice thorough wash job and have this thing looking right. It's a, I love the way these cars look. I'm not a big fan of the aesthetics, the body lines of newer cars, but I mean, as you can see by the fact that I have two of these, I really, really love the way these cars look. They're just one of my favorite looking cars of all time. I don't know if I'm just biased, but I think they look good. So it's nice to keep them clean. It's a little extra motivation. So when we decided to wash up the Daily 2, it was looking pretty crusty, pretty dirty. It had been a while since it got washed, and now both of them are fresh and clean. Again, this is not my thing. I'm not the guy out there washing his cars on a Sunday and detailing them for hours, but I don't like having dirty, filthy cars if I can avoid it, and especially these two. They just look so much better when they're cleaned up. The sun shining on them. I'm happy. It makes me feel good. It gives us some motivation that we're going to need to tear into the rest of this project. All right, we've got this thing back in the shop, back on the lift. It feels so good to see this thing cleaned up. It's been pretty much disgusting the entire time I've owned it, so it's nice to see it clean. I almost don't want to drive it and get it dirty again, but time to move on to some of the other problems, repairs, and upgrades. So the first thing we need to do is kind of a twofer here. So we've got to replace our cooling fan. Unfortunately, we broke it at Spring Break Bash. <laughs> Basically, there's a ring that goes around the fan that connects all the fan blades and it broke. So now when the fan's running at all, but especially when you're ripping on it and it's running at high, it causes a, a pretty intense little vibration. So I bought a brand new cooling fan. Now, unfortunately, these things are very, very expensive. It is a really beefy fan. It's a brushless fan. You can look at the gauge of wire going to it. I mean, it is a beefy unit and it pulls some air and it keeps the car cool. So. One of those things, just had to kind of deal with it, get a new one, hopefully this one will last us a while. But the next upgrade we have is a Mishimoto heat exchanger. So this wasn't really something we saw as a problem when we were drifting it out west because it was so cold out, our intake air temps were good. We have an upgraded Turner by Mishimoto intercooler and that helped a lot. But being back in Florida, even on a not super hot day, the intake air temps were getting in the 130 range during a run and between a run just sitting in grid, we need to, to be able to cool our intercooler down more. And what does that is our heat exchanger, which is mounted up here. It's basically a, a radiator. We have our radiator to cool our engine and we have our heat exchanger to cool the water that's cooling the intercooler core that's cooling the air going into the engine. <laughs> so it's important to have a good intercooler and a good core, but it's also important to have a good heat exchanger up here to cool the water down as much as possible, which will then cool the core down more, which will then cool the air down more. Kind of a compound effect. So I didn't change it before drift week because we just didn't have time. It's gonna require disassembling the whole front end of the car, but since we gotta get in here and pull the fan anyway, might as well get this knocked out too. Help this thing run a little bit cooler at the track. So obviously it's gonna be a lot of work, so I need to quit jibber jabbering and we need to get back to it. So when I first got my white car, my white F80, I remember looking at the engine bay and thinking, I never wanna have to work on this car. That looks looks like an absolute nightmare. There it is just chaos. There is so much going on in this engine bay. But when we decided to build this car, we knew we'd have to get in here and tear this all apart to do the crank hub pinning. And we did, we tore it apart, we pinned the crank hub. We then actually had to tear it apart again at Drift Week to retime the engine because we didn't get it quite right the first time. And honestly, after going in there and, and really tearing apart just about every square inch of this car, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as it looks. We're experienced now and once we know know how things come apart, what goes where, what you gotta take off to get this off, how, how to remove this, how this clips in. It's not terrible, it's not the end of the world. There's still some things that are absolutely buried and I'm not defending BMW here, even when their setups were way simpler, they still found a way to make it complicated, but it just, I'm fortunate that we have the experience of tearing this thing apart a number of times to know how to do all this stuff. You know, pulling one of the intake tubes out is is a challenge and annoying. There's certain things, but once you, once you know the trick, it's not that bad. So we've got everything off to pull the fan off. We decided we might as well go ahead and pull the heat exchanger out because getting those lines out of the way might make it a little easier for us to pull the fan out because it's not that great. Let's see. Scene three, Let's take see. four. Let's see. And action. Ah. Look at that hat. Uh, I don't know where to go with this. Don't throw it on the bed. It's going to do a little on the bed. 
I know, otherwise we took the bumper off, it would be just right there. So I was definitely not expecting, but really hoping that once we took the bumper off, we'd just have clean and clear access to this heat exchanger. And uh, no, that was not the case. There's a lot of stuff in the way. We've got a lot of ducting. We've got the bumper support. There's a lot of things in the way. Now, as I've learned to build cars and as I've built cars, I've come to appreciate this stuff more. Normally, I'd look at this ducting and just see it as a nuisance. This is annoying that I have to remove this, but the ducting is there to make it cool better. So it, it, it helps. It helps with the pain of having to take a million things off to get to the seat exchanger. This is one project I was dreading, and it's this in time or were the reasons we didn't get it done before Drift Week, but I'm glad we're going in here. I'm glad we're taking the time, and uh, we're going to get it done now because once it's done, it's done, and we've got a much better upgraded heat exchanger. We should be able to run cooler and take air temps. It's it's not been in the danger zone, but I, you know, the cooler we can make it run, the more we can drive it hard and not have to worry about it. All right, guys, take a gander the difference in these things. holy moly all right so this is our mishimoto one one thing that's really neat is it comes with this removable rock guard you can see how dented the fins are on all the stock stuff on this one dented and caked with stuff so this is really cool that they include that very smart but you can see let's do a direct side by side you can see how much wider and thicker the mishimoto one is it's significantly taller. It is a much, much beefier unit. It's gonna give us a lot more capacity. So I'm really glad we're doing this. I was <laughs> dreading it. I was kind of being lazy, not wanting to do it. It's definitely gonna be worth it. This is crucial to keeping our intake air temps cool, which is crucial to not blowing up your engine. So uh, definitely something that needed to be done. I've got one for the other car as well. And at least now we'll have practice when we do it on the nice car. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, before we install this though, as Josue so rightly mentioned, we need to get the uh, fan swapped out. While we've got some of the hoses disconnected, hopefully we can get it out without uh, breaking the seal on the engine cooling system. When me and Jordan did it, we had to take some hoses off and we had to drain the whole cooling system. It sucked. So we're trying to avoid that. I know it's really close to being able to come out. Hopefully with the both of us, we can fish it out of there. As you're taking a car apart, like the further and further apart it gets, the more stressful it is. And you're just like, oh, that's another piece that we gotta put back on. Right, but then once you hit this point, I feel like, where you're pretty much done taking things off, it feels better. You're like, all right, well from here it's forward progress. So as soon as I realized that the fan was busted when we were at the track and that I was gonna have to change it, immediate sadness, immediate dread, because I, I had flashbacks to pulling this fan out when me and Jordan did the crank cup pinning and it was awful. It took me and him, which he knows these cars way better than I do, quite a while to get the fan out. So we just dove into it, we started tackling it, and we realized that we had pulled it out the top before, and it looked like it would go out the bottom easier, and what do you know it did? It took a little finagling of some lines, but we managed to get it out the bottom without disconnecting anything on the radiator and without having to drain the cooling system, because that's a whole nother can of worms of bleeding another system and something we were trying to avoid. That was definitely easier than putting it in the top. All right, guys. Fan comes out the bottom. Fan comes out the bottom. That's baby. Fan comes out the bottom. You own an F8. That was great. With the dreaded fan removal and reinstall out of the way, we were riding on a cloud, man. I was so happy to have that done. The heat exchanger, I mean, this, this is nothing in comparison. It, it's easier. It, there's less uh, nuance with trying to get it in and out. It went in, no problems at all. Fits in there, even though it's way larger than the stock one. But there's a lot of parts and pieces involved with getting this thing out. So now that we've got the new one in and we got the lines hooked up, it's uh, putting the puzzle back together. All these different ABS plastic pieces and clips and and ducts and bracing there's there's a lot going on here and uh it's definitely one of those processes where you got to really pay attention to the order of operations how did you take it apart because if you put something in first and then you can't get the next thing in then you got to take it back apart which we did do one time you know one of those things it happens um and then also the hardware there's a lot of hardware involved i'm not big on bagging and tagging my hardware unless it's you know an engine build or something super critical but when sometimes you'll get kind of deep into a project and you'll end up with a lot of hardware and realize there's a lot more pieces involved, which means there's a lot more hardware involved, which means you've got a little more hardware than you expected to have to sort through and determine what goes where. So that was kind of the situation. But luckily, you know, it was different enough to where we knew where each thing went and we were able to put it back together. 
And then the other stuff we already knew how to do. We already had taken that apart, like the oil cooler and the intakes. We unfortunately did have to pull the intakes. I was hoping we could avoid this, but we've got these aftermarket intakes where it puts the filters up in the bumper, which, I mean, it's cool. It sounds cool. It looks cool, but a little bit of a, a nuisance to deal with. So once the intakes were back on, that's the last thing needed to basically complete this thing functionally to where we can fire it up. So the first thing we wanna do before we put the bumper or anything else back on is fill the system and check for leaks. If we have a leak, then we've gotta take all that stuff back apart anyway. So we fill the system as best we can. Don't seem to have any leaks, so now it's time to fire it up and try to bleed all the air out of the system. Now this is, one of the trickiest parts when you're working with any sort of cooling system is you've got to bleed all the air out. If you ever open it, if you introduce any air, just like a brake system, you've got to bleed all the air out. So we get this thing fired up and it was bleeding all right, but it just, it didn't seem like we got all the air out. It didn't seem like we had great flow all the way through. So we decided, all right, well, we've got no leaks. That was our biggest concern before putting this stuff back on. So we can go ahead and move forward, put the car back together, and then the plan is to go drive it, let it get warm, and see if we can get the rest of that air out. So we went ahead and tossed the front bumper back on, and then it's just all the little odds and ends. We've got a skid plate for the oil cooler. We've got the main skid plate for the oil pan and underneath the car. You've got fender aligners that tie in with the ducting. There's just a lot of things that kind of interlace like these braces and the engine bay and all of this stuff definitely makes these kind of cars a, a little bit more difficult to work on, a little bit more of a nuisance, but they're also what makes the car perform so well and what makes it so cool. It's a trade-off and we knew what we were getting ourselves into. All right, well, we got this thing all the way put back together. Man, does it feel good <laughs> to have those two projects done. I was dreading both of those projects. They both require getting really deep in there, but they both absolutely 100% needed to get done for what we're doing with this car. A, the fan was broken, but B, the heat exchanger is gonna make a big difference in being able to hot lap this thing. So really stoked to have that all finished up. We even got the front splitter, front whip reattached better than ever. This thing was never on there very well because we took it with us to Drift Week and put it on at the first track of Drift Week. You know, in the pits, in the gravel, didn't have quite the right tools or the right hardware. Took a little more time here in the shop, got it really nice and firmly attached. It is uh, it is one with the bumper now. I don't think it's coming off, so that's good. Because <laughs> towards the end of Drift Week, it was hanging on by a thread and we had to fix it a couple times. So uh, with that, we're wrapped up for the most part with this stuff. So I got some other stuff to do, but with this stuff, however, I have my, my concerns that the cooling system for the intercooler is not bled all the way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get it off the lift, go drive it, make sure everything works, let everything get warmed up, and then see if we can get that last bit of air out of the system before we go take this thing on the long drive down to Mexico to do some, uh, some skids. gauge is pulled up intake air temps are sitting at 75 degrees which is like the temperature it was in the shop um, so so far we're good there creeping up a little bit so we'll keep an eye on that speedo still working this is the third drive now since we've made those changes I'd be curious if I put my uh, my diff motor back in if it would get rid of my diff lock and chassis stabilization errors. I love this car. I really do. It's just so crazy. Like, it is a totally capable drift car. We're driving it around right now, windows up, AC on. I think my plan worked. See the foam bubbles before this is one of the hoses going to the, the upper and like you couldn't feel any water going through it when you squeeze it which i know before that's how it felt that's how i checked it when i put the intercooler on so it's definitely getting good flow now so we're gonna let it bleed out a little more now that it's warm but plan worked so that's good so now that I've got the system bled, I wanna take Josue for a drive and go check out our Mexico spot and see what's going on there. But first, we've got a little project to do. This is the most BMW upgrade project I've ever done, and it is replacing our seat emblems. So these light up, which is really neat, 
but the pre-2018 ones, they wore out and got all cracked and faded like ours are, and you can replace them with the newer 2018 ones. So as silly as it is, I decided to keep the stock seats and not put buckets in the car, so I wanted to get these swapped out. You gotta basically pull the seat cover back, you pop the old emblem out, and then I had to repin some connectors while Josue was doing that to get everything to plug in, and uh, we've got some new seat emblems that look a lot nicer. It's, it's silly, it's a small thing. Again, most BMW thing I've done, but it is satisfying. The little things, when all put together, end up making the biggest difference. So nice to have a working speedo, dude. <laughs> Every time the door's locked, I'm like, oh, that's right, it's working. OG spot I found when I was looking to start drifting and practicing and the funniest part is the reason I found it was not for that big open lot <laughs> I was I came here to drift these little turns this is what I saw on the Google Maps and was like I could drift that this this turn we're going around right now and learn how to drift there I didn't even think of going to a big open spot this is pretty wild. So it was at 220, I had it in efficient mode. I switched it to Sport Plus, which will make it run cooler. And it's dropped from 221 to 207 in like 203. <laughs> like, what, 10 seconds, 15 seconds? Wow. I know the fan's working. Yeah, 192. Take care temp's still 100. I think she's solid, Josue. Solid rig. I love this car so much, dude. I can't even describe how much I love this damn car. I wish we had some more people who were down for Mexico. I mean, pff, wish we had some more people. We're not even down for Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard, because it's like, you know, we gotta like, call it a day, go hang out, and then go back out. Like, to get me back out after I've already called it a day yeah. is challenging. Yeah, same. You know, to get me back out of the house one time we get home. It's like right. I don't Once go I go home. inside, I shower. I'm clean. I eat. I'm like, all right, I'm good. Whereas when I have my vet days, me up at like midnight, one a.m., be like, yo, we're going to Mexico. I'd be like, all right, <laughs> leave the house, drive forty-five minutes to right. OBT. You're out the house in less than five. Yeah, literally. So after driving the car with the ABS errors fixed and all those other little things, I wanted to try to take it a step further and see if we could fix another error, which is our locking differential. So these cars have an electric locking diff. It's basically a motor that locks or unlocks the diff. Now, we used this originally and it worked pretty well, but in some scenarios it would unlock. So we put a manual setup in where we're basically locking the diff to where it's locked at all times. It's essentially the same thing as a welded diff, but that makes it pretty mediocre to drive on the street. So my idea is that maybe now that our ABS sensors are working, since that's something the electric motor uses to know when to lock and unlock the diff, maybe it'll work a little bit better this time and it'll be good enough to where we could just run the factory electric motor, the factory electric locking diff and have a much nicer car to drive on the street without sacrificing that much performance on the track. It's a long shot. I don't think it's going to work as well as I'm hoping, but it's easy enough to change. So I figured it was worth a shot. Let's see what happens. All right, let's see how this feels now. I don't know if you're able to tell from the camera. Oh, it's so much better. Oh, man, the thing's in your way again. I don't know, man. This car had, like, the worst just bind of any car I've had with a welded diff. Oh, so much better. <laughs> oh, that's nice. It's like I don't have to daily this car, but I want it to be a good street car. It's important to me. The traction control works now. It was on. That's so much better with turning now, though. Like, I can push the clutch in, we're coasting. 
Before with the diff, if I was turning this far, it would just stop. As soon as I let off the gas, it would stop. We'll, we'll have to try it out at an event. I think that's really going to be the only way we're going to get kind of a definitive if it's worth leaving the motor in or going back to the lock diff. Did those two events with it, uh, two and a half. We did the two times at Muscleman on the Muscleman. Did a bunch of laps there and only really one section did I have an issue with it like unlocking and the car just having to straighten out um and then willow long you had to really drag it out and that it would unlock there and that's when we finally put that the diff lock in and it, it definitely drifted way better well we've officially fixed pretty much all our errors all we have left is the shock one that gets coated out whenever you put coilovers on a car something you have to do and the tpms one which again i'm probably just going to swap the sensors and have the daily wheels and then just drift on the other ones and then we will have no more errors, which is sick. Let me just show you. I guess you didn't see it before, but check it out. So before, when you started this thing up, you had a Christmas tree and you had a whole bunch of warnings. Now, there will literally be about that many lights on the dash when you start it up. Nothing, look at that. So we got, should pop up, there it is, chassis air. So that's for the shocks. Clear that and we're done, that's it. That's all we've got to deal with now, which is amazing <laughs> because those errors had kind of a compound effect. Like I said, the, the hill assist on the braking and stuff, but even the ABS was inactive because ABS sensors weren't working. The airbags were inactive because the ABS sensors weren't working and didn't know vehicle speed. There's just all these things that, that wouldn't work anymore because all of those sensors weren't reading. So fixing that, putting the diff motor in. We got rid of most of them, which feels good, man. We managed to kind of go through and, and fix all my grievances from Drift Week that we just didn't really have time or the ability or the parts to fix during Drift Week. And uh, it feels good. I like, I like that tinkery little stuff at the end of a build to get it just to that 100%. It feels good. So yeah, that being said, time will tell on the diff thing whether or not uh, it works well enough. You know, it's, it's always a compromise and I'm fine with losing a little bit of performance to make it way more comfortable for street driving. But if it's losing a ton of performance and it doesn't drift very well, make it way better for street driving, it's not necessarily worth that trade-off. We'll have to put the diff lock back in or come up with another solution to, to actuate the motor or whatever. Um, there's options, but I wanna try this out. I wanna see how it locks, you know, and how it does drifting now that at least our sensors are all working and communicating with it, so. We'll see, time will tell. But that being said, that is gonna be a wrap. Thanks for watching. Oh, wait, one more thing, one more thing. Comment, roof box, no roof box. <laughs> roof rack, roof rack and box, no roof rack, no box. It's growing on me now that when I first took it off, it looked naked, but now it's kinda, it's kinda growing on me with no box, so I might leave it for a little while, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, but for now, that's gonna be a wrap. Thank you guys for watching. Thanks for subscribing, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.